So Joshua King, rather than reading a, a prepared bio of you, we thought it uh, might be more fun if you would give us a rundown of yourself and your background. Wow, yeah, perfect. Thanks for skipping the, the bios, the TV, first entry paragraph. Heard that one a bunch. Um, yeah, I'm an artist here in Dallas. Um, I went to the University of North Texas. Um, and uh, like I was saying to you before this kind of started, I found the Cedars uh, and the American Beauty Mill in South Dallas uh, when I came to town in 2005. Um, and when I got here, um, I kind of was on a mission to meet as many artists as possible and really dive into what the creative community was, how to get started, who are the players who have been here, um, who are the, you know, diverse artists that are trying different things, um, and what is the city's, like, creative landscape really look like. Um, so I have my teeth in photography as a background. Uh, so I got my, you know, um, undergrad from UNT in photography. And when I got here, I started with a book called Rise. Uh, where I would go around and document the artists of Dallas, the Cedars specifically, in their studios. And the, the concept of the book was always about the rise of the creative soul and individual within a creative space. Um, so that was like project one, like as soon as I moved into to my own studio uh, in South Dallas. And with that, I was able to just meet an amazing group of artists that I befriended really well, um, met one of them who was, uh, ended up being a, a huge mentor in my life and also the other co-founder of Aurora, Shane Pennington. Um, so that's where him and I met was through that project that I started as soon as I got here to Dallas. Um, and soon after meeting Shane, like he does with everybody, he brings this like beauty, energy and talent out of everybody around him. Um, he asked me if I would help him produce an exhibition uh, on light, video, and sound. Um, and it worked out where producing exhibitions, photo shoots, those things was kind of like a, a passion of mine, something I always loved doing, you know. Um, the first one I did was out of a, a U-Haul truck in, with an artist collective out of Denton called Parallax. And we just drove around to all the bars at eat on Fridays and Saturday nights shell sell photographs at the back of the u-haul you know and that was like freshman year in college and so i just kept producing these exhibitions um critiques artist gatherings unique events and so when shane asked me to do this on my video and sound uh, he immediately wanted to hook it up with uh the cedars open studios which is a you know a 20 year old you know uh, open studios project out of the cedars uh, and then he wanted to do, then we wanted to do it at the Dallas Heritage Village. And the Dallas Heritage Village really opened up their doors to us and said, we would love to see what an exhibition at night uh, would look like with our city's artists uh, under the kind of umbrella of light, video, and sound. Uh, so that was 2010. And then after that, we just kind of had to buckle up and take the ride of what Aurora has been bringing to us. That's actually a really natural progression then to go, uh, to be formally trained in photography, to go straight into both light and image at night. Um, yeah. We are going to conduct the interview from a, a very specific artist point of view rather than general public. So if anyone watching has any questions, jump on in and, uh, and I, will get them to, um, I will get them out as soon as I can. Um, so considering the artist's perspective, uh, what is it that Aurora is looking for in a project? Mm, I think one of our key things that we started um, with was how do we create a, a dialogue and a confluence of collaboration? Um, it's not just about artists growing their resumes, CVs, bodies of work, here in the city of Dallas. It's about growing who they are as an individual, who they are as an artist, their relationships beyond our city, you know? And so we look for artists who try to really focus both, you know, large, like 
in Dallas, the national and the international. And sometimes we help make those connections and we look at bringing in a more of a national curator to come to this town to work with our local artists to build those relationships and to really, you know, start um, start a relationship with somebody else in the arts. So are you, in a sense, matchmaking collaborations or is it more uh, individual artists working side by side? Um, and is, it there, is there any kind of element then of local artists having to compete against possibly more experienced and more well-known new media artists from somewhere else around the globe? Yeah, yeah, no. Um, kind of to the second part of the question, is you're never in competition with other artists. We build upon ourselves, you know, and we build upon the shoulders of other artists, you know, and so it's that collaboration kind of like together that happens and our local artists their work has to stand not here in Dallas their work has to stand through the test of time and what everybody else is so I we never see it as a competition um but being from the city and, and knowing of how it takes our local institutions to foster the artists of this city the living the working the young, the emerging, the established, that their careers take a dialogue. Uh, and when our you know, institutions engage in those dialogues and help those move forward, it's really interesting. You know? um, and so that's one that we've always been with, with our artists, it's like, what's next? You know, not what are we just doing today, but what's next? And trying to bring that together. How do you find your curators? Ah, so we, we've got a very special person on board that's actually been on our team for quite some time, 2013. Um, her name is Monica Salazar. Uh, she has a, a wonderful partner named Anna Russ, uh, and they run a company called Mona and Berlin Hartley. Um, we've known them for years. In 2013, we reached out to them and asked them to help just with kind of our communications and um, kind of our whole brand development and, you know, what Aurora was becoming really, you know, an institution in 2013, we started getting major corporate sponsors, we started actually having budgets behind projects, you know, it was this kind of thing. Um, so in 2013, we reached out to them in that. Um, and the beautiful thing about Monica and Anna is they travel the world to go write about all of the art fairs, to go write about all the biennial of trying, that's their kind of life. Um, and so with that, we had this great opportunity kind of born to bring them on board to our team. And so she is this kind of hidden figure behind Aurora that is bringing us new talent, new, new projects, new curators. You know, she's out there seeing what's happening all across the globe and she was before the pandemic came in. And, you know, so she was constantly going, hey, have you checked out this artist? Do you know about this curator? And, and making that connection. 2013, um, was that the first year in the arts district? That I think that was the first time I saw Aurora. So the, the um, timeline goes 2010 at the Dallas Heritage Village. We went to 2011 right into the arts district and then 13 we got into the biannual format, you know. So 2013 was the year that um, things got a lot larger for us. We were able to bring larger crowds. Um, we got a lot of, you know, uh, kind of like validity and reputation after 2013. I did, um, I ended up going in 2013 only because a friend texted me who was already there who worked at the DMA and the text just said, get down here now. <laughs> I, knew, I knew when I saw those words that I was missing something big and I grabbed the keys, got straight in the car and it was packed, but I had never seen, I've lived in Dallas a long time and I had never seen 
a, any portion of the landscape used in such a site-specific way. And for me, it was the use of the Wiley, but everyone I saw that night had a different favorite moment or a different favorite space. And I, I feel confident in speaking for the collective of uh, the thousands and thousands of people who were there that night. Um, I didn't know that could be done in my city. Um, so eventually, uh, it did move out of the arts district. I believe that was because it got too big for that space, maybe. But uh, I'm, I'm taking a, a long route to get to the next question, which is, when these international artists come in, or even local or national artists, what is the process and relationship in terms of the projection they create or the light work they create with the space itself? Because I know unexpected spaces is a great theme of Aurora. So what is it, is it designed for that space? Or does a proposal happen first, which is then adapted for the space? Um, I can say that there is no one formula for how we make these works come to life. Every artist and curator is such a different approach to the exhibition that it evolves every time. That's what makes the project, you know, really engaging and fun. You know, after 10 years, every time we do this, it feels like a completely different approach than what we did the previous year and it's kind of like no matter how many sometimes I try to put these parameters and processes in it it ends up molding to the creative uh, individuals and leaders who kind of take forth in each project um, we do a, a big kind of like portfolio of location like you know I take that photography background and I go photograph every inch of the footprint or or if we're bringing on a new location like we, you know, we did like Arts Mission of Cliff in 2018. We had never done anything. We go there and we like, okay, do you have blueprints? Do you have photographs? Do you have a tech spec? You know, we get all these like uh, architectural engineering details of the space. So we can hopefully, we take videos and photos. So we want to work with the artists in trying to say, this is the space. This is everything we can. What's, what questions do you need that we can work together to bring a proposal to life? There's, we've done different things in presenting work, creating new permissions. Um, and right now there is just no, like, this is how we do it every time. Every, every, every year it seems to evolve even more uh, and, and kind of wind its way to the exhibition. Have you had spaces coming to you begging to be included as a site? Yeah, you know, there's definitely been those people who's like, well, will be like, hey, can you do something here? And I'm like, cool. Uh, I got to think about it. And I, that's kind of what I like. I, in my personal work, I, I work with a lot of um, mass produced objects, you know, and I do a lot of repetition of form. And so even in my personal work and in Aurora, you know, people will bring me things and be like, is there anything you can be creative here with? And so from looking into architectural spaces to, you know, I've been dropped off like boxes of doorknobs before. Like, I, okay, so. You mentioned parameters earlier. Um, since you are officially a light technology community, do you have a minimum amount of technology, especially that must be included for the artist to be a good fit for Aurora? We, we, we look at those two, like three boxes, right? Like the, the technology aspect, the fact that it is an art, a work of art and not, you know, a marketing sign or something like a, just the technology that it is an actual work of art. And then we also look at like the community aspect of it to it, you know, like art in public spaces and art in, uh, out in the city um, is kind of important for us that it's not just uh, approachable by the, the consumers and the players of the art world, but that fact that it's approachable by anyone, you know? And so we look at all three of those uh, and kind of go through there. And, and when we form an exhibition, we try to have a well-balanced, you know, uh, local artists, national artists, the international player, 
And then we'll kind of go back in there and say, okay, do we have the community aspect? Do we have the, the technology aspect to this? Do we have the performance aspect to it? So we kind of look at all the, the sectors that the arts kind of, you know, separate themselves into. And then we look at our exhibitions and say, are we balanced across that board um, to bring a well-rounded show together? We've referenced a lot of the past biennial events, um, but Aurora is taking a new direction now. Can you talk about the differences and all, also the things that you're bringing from the past events yeah. uh, for the next year or so? Well, there's unfortunately a lot of uncertainty on everything right now on what we're going to be able to do, but we're excited that Aurora is a public art exhibition that is outside um, that there's ways that we can bring art to life with or without the live event and audience. And so our curator, Noam Siegel, and our team have just been working nonstop and really closely on how are we able to evolve and hit a play button on the next six months, no matter what the pandemic uh, kind of direction is, you know. Um, and so we're, we're getting real close to going, this is how we're going to move forward. This is how we can do it safely. This is how we can bring art back to the people and bring them uh, to experience something unique again. Um, but the first shift of what happened when COVID-19 hit was that we had to cancel this year's large scale on November 7th at City Hall. Um, and when we did that, we immediately knew that there was going to be a giant financial just wave across the arts of what was about to happen uh, from COVID. So we established an artist relief fund for our city's artists. Uh, we're about to announce the first two grants from that. They're $4,000 grants that are going to go to North Texas artists. Um, we'll also be opening up the second round for submissions for that for the next applications as well um, coming in September. So that was the first thing we knew as a working artist and as somebody who's constantly in the dialogue with these, with our city's artists, we knew that the jobs were disappearing and they're still gone. Uh, there's been this amazing, um, you know, reaction from the philanthropic community, from our foundations and from several key corporate sponsors to bring a support line to the arts and to our major organizations that make the city so great. Um, but it needs to go further and it needs to get directly into the hands of artists, you know, and it's not by saying, hey, here's a financial project. I need you to get to work in these times. No, it's going, here's a grant that can help you live and keep your family fed and your rents paid and your projects alive um, is a, an important factor that still just isn't happening so we'll be dedicating all of North Texas Giving Day to fundraising for that. Um, but because in that band stand right now, there's not a lot of people. There's hardly anybody holding that up and saying, how are artists going to survive? Everybody's asking, how are these organizations going to survive? Because they have these giant overheads. Um, so that is the, the big switch for Aurora and taking on a kind of a new you know, platform within a, um, a mission saying, we gotta just get past this and make sure that our city doesn't have a complete, you know, um, loss of the creative community because we can't sustain. And you all know the longer you go without sustaining and making your artwork, the harder it is to go back and start those careers again. You know, the reality of everyday overhead, families, rent, that stuff becomes really evident. You know, so how can we make sure the artists get as far as possible down this timeline until when projects are feasible again? How would you describe a strong candidate for the relief fund as opposed to a weak candidate for the relief fund? Could you say it one more time? How would I? How would you describe a strong candidate? Who, I guess a different way of putting that is, uh, what criteria are you using to determine how those grants are awarded? Okay, gotcha. Okay, that, that, thank you. Um, we're, we're looking for, A, first of all, the, the need 
for financial relief and making sure that the impact that you have sustained is actually felt. Then it is the, the work that you are doing in the community. Uh, and what has your work been all about for the last, you know, for the, the iteration of your uh, creative life cycle? And then what are you trying to still do right now with or without anything in our kind of community um, for, for, for that basically application? But it, it is open to all artists, you know, and that was something we did big. And we're kind of going to be moving it farther into artists who work in art and technology and community uh, in this kind of thing, in this kind of next round. So um, it's going to kind of keep evolving. Uh, one of the major, you know, um, questions we asked when we started this was, is this just a grant? Is this just a relief a check that's written and we need to focus just on that and try to keep raising money and keep going? Or is this a platform and a hub? And so we were like, we need to make sure that even if we do give a grant away or even to the people who might not get the grant, what are the opportunities here that Aurora and these artists can collaborate with and work on, you know, making sure we all survive in this time um, and build new relationships? Because this is a thing that we're meeting new people, just like you and I, for the first time we're getting to meet virtually through this. It is a chance to build new connections uh, and foster those new relationships and explore and experiment and where they can lead. Uh, we've talked to, uh, we've mentioned uh, corporate funding in a few different ways already. Um, the importance and value of uh, a corporate donation, but then there's also a risk factor with corporate involvement in terms of marketing. Uh, what I'm specifically res uh, referring to from my own history is, um, I've, I've only been to South by Southwest, another homegrown festival, um, twice in my life. And the first time was in 2010, and it still had that initial flavor of a homegrown community coming together to celebrate music. And I happened to be there during Film and Interactive instead. But um, everyone spoke to everyone. And you could really move in and out of panels easily and get into almost any screening unless it was a big Hollywood thing. I didn't go again until 2018. And suddenly, well, I guess it wasn't sudden. Over eight years, there had been a radical, radical change. And everything was branded and corporate sponsored. And you could not, you could not move about so easily. People were keeping to themselves or just keeping with their own companions. So the sense of community was gone, at least for me, and um, everything had a long line. So in those eight years, South By completely changed to a national, probably international corporate event rather than Austin's homegrown celebration of their art scene. Um, do you feel or have you experienced any vulnerabilities in, in that way for Aurora? Or do you have any, I guess, uh, guards in place in order to keep that from happening? Or would you be okay with that happening? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So it's, it's one of those things that you play tug of war with constantly and trying to find more money so you can fund more artists and more projects but at each time you do that you're having to figure out ways of you know proving a return of investment on that money um and so there's a lot of conversations that you have to have during that and that's one of these things that i love about uh being an executive director of aurora is like i, I have to have those conversations and engage in a whole different aspect of not just my artist community right I've got to go to board meetings and, you know, round table community, community meetings and different things like this. And I'm like, this is way out of the arts now. This is a, a business negotiation conversation, you know? And so you find yourselves in, in these different situations. Uh, and that's one of the things I love about creating your own projects and, and doing these kinds of things. You learn as you go. 
We were very fortunate with the Dallas Morning News being one of our very first corporate sponsors of significant weight. Um, and I used to have what, you know, Allison Draper was the mayor. And we call it like the blue eyed stare down. And she would just be looking at you and I just have to look back at her and be like, are we going to be able to work this out together? And are you not going to try to steal the event and ruin it with a corporate soul? You know, and then she's looking at me and going, can I trust you as an artist in the city not to, you know, get me fired? You know, and so we had these like great long conversations. You know, where and I like one of the final days, like before we signed, like we had, we had a meeting over at Shane Studio, and I was just like, oh, okay, I brought my dog with me. I was like, okay, Jago's got to meet Allison. This is a telltale test to see what my dog does, right? Like it's this whole like kind of thing of like, am I signing the check? You know, taking the money. Um, but it's one of these things that we took the playbook out of the museum world, and and we noticed how they did their sponsorship how they work with corporate sponsors. And, and then we, we looked at what festivals did and what the music did and what the music then seen did and said, okay, there's a two completely different worlds happening here. There is somewhere in between here that is a, is a good walk for us, you know? And, and so we, we constantly just try to fill that line and hear where it's going. And, um, always checking those kinds of things. But I think corporate sponsorship, you know, it brings its own headaches, but it brings so much power to it because without the Dallas Morning News, um, AT&T, Reliant, those people who had come on board and trusted us and, and brought a, a slew of just power beyond finance and beyond money, they brought a lot of other things to them, uh, to us as well. So. It's one you take every year and every time it's a new conversation uh, with every company. It's interesting to me that you mentioned uh, the various playbooks that you studied to learn uh, how to handle or ways you might handle all these, um, these other aspects beyond the art side of things. Um, and yet you did not mention any other comparable light festivals. Um, are you, I have you been to others? Uh, there are not a lot in the United States. I've looked into this a little bit. And last year, the only other one I've been to outside of Aurora was last October. I actually went to Nuit Blanche, Paris. Yeah. And what's interesting about the European model is um, there is one night, usually in October, it may always be in October, for decades that several major European cities will hold a light festival all on the same night. And in, um, in fact, Canada has them as well, I think on the same night, because I was torn between Toronto and Paris. And how can you not go to Paris? Yeah. They didn't make a time, because it was October, uh, you know, five months later, COVID hit. Um, but I am fascinated that you did not mention, at least on that question, the study of other light festivals. So can you talk about what, yeah. that was a conscious choice or if you have been to others? Um, I'm, I'm very curious about that. Yeah, yeah. No, um, we started regionally and really looking at what was happening in Dallas and why was Dallas not able to get over the last several you know, years, a major cultural event in the city. You know, it's like, why had we not already had a major event? or why had that not stayed. So we, we looked at what was happening in North Texas uh, and what was with, what was working and wasn't working within our cultural organization and festivals. Um, I've gone to the Nuit Blanche in Toronto, Electra in Montreal, uh, and there's a slew that are happening over uh, in Europe. Uh, Vivid Sydney in Australia is also a big one as well. Um, we looked at all of those as well, especially when it came more to programming. And, and so that's when we were looking at those events and saying, what are they doing for programming? And then we looked at those events and said, what are they doing for marketing? You know, um, and we said, how can we distinguish ourselves from those other events? Because they are happening so widely and a lot of them have shelf lives that aren't sustainable. And a lot of them built their, you know, their playbook off tourism, uh, and then off the, the local scene only, 
you know, and so it, we just saw it. Said there's something wrong with it that's not here. It's not about the art, you know. And I'm an artist, and so the conversation is not about the the life of the art and what's the concept. Jonas Darty from UNT, beautiful professor who just taught me like if it doesn't have the concept and you're not asking why and digging into these like deeper questions, then it's not you know. It's not a conversation I want to engage in. I don't see myself going really far into those conversations. You know, so I was like, this has to be about art. And I think we're, you know, new media are, you know, compared to photography a lot and it's timeline. And right now there's still not clarity, understanding and a mass uh, awareness of art technology. Of, and what they're doing and that what that confluence is right now um but i think the pandemic has actually put it on a fast track and i think uh, in the next 20 years what our museums look like how people experience performances how people experience art is going to completely be different you know than what we've been doing for the last century you know so being in this kind of sector i was like we need to focus on uh, the artists of today uh, and the artists of tomorrow. And let's really try to be relevant, not in preserving, you know, the art of yesterday, but putting out there to mass audiences uh, what is happening uh, all around the world, basically, and on every campus and university. Uh, how big do you want to go ultimately? We know uh, war has been up and running since 2010 in various stages. Yes. Uh, but all, each of those stages has been a growth stage. So are you making, do you have a 10 year plan or a five year plan? How big can it get? Yeah, you know, um, I think the sky's the limit with it right now. Um, I think the way we're coming to come out of the pandemic is gonna be completely um, interesting uh, when we do come out of this time. Uh, and I, I think people are going to be well more connected to um, the arts through technology. Uh, so there's a lot of, you know, ways of looking at that 10 year plan. I told a lot of people like, in our 10 year plan, we're still focused on what is, you know, it's a five page document. And we had paid one and two for the last two to three years, like hot and heavy focus. The pandemic hit. Right, and I was like, what are we gonna do? You know, I was like, how's this gonna be shift? And you know, I turned to page three and I was like, okay, here's how we do it. We expand it, we move into lower markets and smaller things in different cities. And okay, and page four is like, okay, yes, we gotta work with the artists of tomorrow and start collaborations with universities, other events, other cities and this kind of aspect. So it's like, okay, we, we get to move into that 10 year plan. Uh, and I think in the beginning, Aurora asked itself a lot, is like, how big could we get? You know, uh, now it's how deep of a value can we bring? How big of an impact can we make uh, from what we're doing? So that question changed as well after March. Can you talk a little bit more about collaborations with universities that you just mentioned? Um, you're a UNT? guy uh, in photography. I'm a UTV girl. And uh, before the broadcast went live, um, I was telling you about how my UTV arts and technology program, which was from 2006 to 2008, is very, very different from what that program looks like now. Um, we did not have state-of-the-art technology in my day. Um, and now that Richardson campus absolutely has state-of-the-art technology. Um, so I'm curious about your conversations that you may already have had or plan to have with the various universities in town. Um, and then I'll have as part two of that question is if someone has not been or is not part of a formal new media training process, what can they do if they are a, a practitioner of more traditional forms to learn that side. Mm -hmm. So part one, universities. Uh, yeah, we, we've had a lot of collaborations with local universities and the professors. We, we really tried to work closely with the professors.
professors at each of these departments, we find like that's a, a, a well, um, it's a good way in without getting into the bureaucracy of a giant university, right? And getting through all the different departments they do that. So uh, the professors at different universities like David Stout and Alicia Egger were two really quick connections that we had. Um, and then, you know, Clyde Val um, Valentin and Sam Holland over at SMU, I was able to make good connections with through some other artists and other professors as well. And so we've kind of had these collaborations going and they always kind of scale up or scale down with the focus of each year. Um, and it's also one that we like the curators to be a part of those collaborations, not just something that Aurora is bringing as part of programming, but how can our curators work with these different universities as well? You know, um, so UTD is one that we've been reaching out to and hopefully we'll be starting, we had some great connections start of this year or kind of moving forward before the pandemic hit, everything kind of hit pause on that. But it's great to see what they've been doing over there with ATAC. It's great to have uh, a local university really taking focus on the future of art uh, and how does it influence and how is it influenced through technology. So we're really excited about that opportunity. Uh, but right now we've got to kind of keep our hats where we're at and move forward. So the second part of the question was, yeah. what kind of resources or advice or recommendations would you give to someone who's maybe a Gen Xer and a, a painter or a printmaker who wants to move their practice forward into new media experiments? Because I have to tell you, even as someone who did go to a new media, a formal new media program, um, I went in as a writer and my, my program at the time uh, had a lot of gamers and game designers. Yeah. Uh, and it was, it was very loose, which I loved and was perfect for me. And you could explore where your interests were under a very big umbrella. And it is my understanding over time, it's become a uh, much more formalized. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think I would be lost if I, if I went to Aurora and saw the scale of some of these projects, whether national, local, or international, and think there's no way in hell I can ever do that. The, um, I could think of one from uh, 2018, two years ago on the side of, if, if it wasn't on City Hall, it was right next to it. Um, and it's on, it's on the Aurora web, website and I stood me mesmerized. Yeah. Uh, I just can't imagine how that was even done. Uh, <laughs> I, know like, I can tell you, you're probably talking about Rafiq Anadol's melting memories because that's how. What? <laughs> you know, yeah, he's one of those artists uh, that is uh, amazing. Um, and, you know, he's, he's a professor, I think, at UC Berkeley, and he can just. He's done these crazy projects, and no matter who you are talking to him or seeing his projects, it's like, how does he do this? Uh, and it's one of those brilliant artists that I love getting to work with and getting to listen to and create a dialogue. That is exactly uh, one of the main reasons. Um, I would say, just like you said about that work, find an artist you love and try to copy her work. Just try it. You know, it's, you'll find so much from just trying to do that. Uh, and it's one of those things that you learn from the masters, find mentors, go clean somebody's studio, do, you know, ask a million questions. There's just like, pick up the phone, send an email, connect through Instagram. We have more ways of connecting through technology than we've ever had. So if you can find somebody out there who's a living artist, it's fairly easy to find a way to contact them and say, I love your work, you know, and that right there will, will make their day because being an artist, an executive director, or any of this, it, uh, a lot of times it's just a lonely world you see out there. You, then you see the exhibitions and then it's back into your cave of producing things. Um, um, we have a, a, a guest answerer um, through our Q&A system named Hugh Livingston, who uh, has given a list of 
Um, I guess they're, Hugh, let me know if these are all light festivals. I'm, I'm assuming they are. Um, Bee Cave, Texas, Canal, Convergence, Phoenix, Reno, Winter, Lighted. I've never heard of any of these. Napa Valley, Lighted, Philadelphia, Longwood, Chicago Botanical Garden, Georgetown Glow, San Antonio, really? Yeah. Um, they're, over they're really all over the place. And, and it's really kind of like, once you get down into it, there's a lot that you can go to. Uh, and they all try to do different things. And I think that's where Aurora really tried to differentiate itself from just the other light festivals, right? It's like, this is an art exhibition. The artists that we're presenting are working artists of the day and who we believe will be in the history books of what and they're talking about art in the 21st century. They're gonna be talking about the artists that we've exhibited and helped foster their careers. So that is where we really put a focus on Aurora compared to a lot of other places where, you know, the festivals of having people come together and provide great entertainment is a very valid and worthy cause of, of worth doing. But when I wake up every morning, it, it's really trying to figure out how are we making art that changes the world. What has the response been like for the curators and the artists that you brought in, uh, whether nationally or in internationally, the non-locals to, to your work here? That's kind of been the also a uh, great aspect of it. It's when we are able to bring other creatives to the city of Dallas, they're always really amazed at, at our city. Um, and I think that's kind of both the, the key everybody gets when they visit Dallas. They're like, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I really like it after they come here. Um, and that's kind of the, the, the power and strength of our community, um, of kind of our founding families, our philanthropic community. There's been this long line of people who do support uh, the arts here in the city, support uh, the cultural organizations and support the artists. And so it's been a really great place to birth a project or to bring something to life. I mean, that was what I, in 2005, when I came here, I could just see like the soil was great. You just need to plant some roots, trust it for a while, and this some, something great will come out of it, you know? Um, so that's the one thing when we work with other artists and our curators, they're really a, just amazed at how collaborative the city actually is, um, you know, and what's actually capable. Are there certain sacrifices you're having to make in the shift to a new direction that you wish you could maintain from prior events or the prior way of doing things, whether it's COVID induced or not, that you um, are sorry to let go of? Um, I think it's really hard in, in finding ways of getting artists to do site specific artwork. You know, there was a very much of a hands-on go to a location and create something out of nothing as a team. Um, that has been a really difficult part where we're trying to continue in uh, the way through COVID right now. Um, and then it's also like there was a magic in bringing 60,000 people to Dallas City Hall in 2018, and the same in the Arts District when we brought 50,000 people together for a completely free event. And you could just see the, the, you know, the wonder and how people would approach these artworks uh, and how some people who had never been to a cultural, you know, district or to a museum or to 18th Performing Arts Center, people who had never gone to these neighborhoods we're here for the first time. And that was really fun. And I think it's, you know, I think I love about, you know, artist projects sometimes and not so much of an institutional lot led program is that there's a lot of flexibility. There's a lot of, you know, pivot shift and moving forward, you know, instead of pivot shift, go back 10 feet, you know? And so that's what I really like about you know, artist collaborations, you get to see that happen time and time again and again. And artists just want the best for their artwork. And so they will do everything possible to make it the best. 
And when you're an organization who wants the same thing, uh, and then you have a deadline coming down on you of, oh, there's going to be 50,000 people coming here. There's this really great moment of working together through all sorts of unexpected problems that is the beauty of a production, the beauty of an art exhibition, the beauty of artists, you know? So if you had to say like, what am I worried about happening? It's like, I'm gonna be stuck behind this laptop producing things uh, that we won't get to have that what now moment, how are we gonna solve this? We don't have the right tools and things like this and then make it work um, and nobody knows. It's fun to think um, that people who have had never been to a cultural event, people inside that 50 and 60,000 um, got the exact same text I did and I go to every cultural event. Get down here now. Um, I bet that happened a lot. <laughs> I was thinking it was just me. No, it was probably, probably about half of us. Um, so what, can, will there be another biennial eventually? Um, and what will the next, if whether yes or no, what will the next outdoor events feel like for the audience? Hopefully exactly how it felt the last time, you know, um, that's the goal is to find a way to connect our audience again to uh, public artwork and to connect them to art and technology and to have them be able to approach a space that maybe they've seen every day, but after we we put our spin to it, they never thought they would see it that way. So um, that is the hope for it, but until the pandemic comes, I hope we can find a great way of bringing great artwork to people safe. Will it always stay inside a Dallas city limits, or could there be some potential for Aurora Plano? As crazy as that yeah, so I think, but, but more of a North Texas event, um, it, would that even be possible? Absolutely, I think that is. I think Dallas is our home. Dallas is where the biennial is. But I think the mission is not the the legacy of Dallas. It is the the, the movement of art and technology and our community's awareness of this movement. So it, I definitely can see Aurora happening in different places across the globe, uh, as long as it's held to its key standards, art, technology, and community. Um, we only have a few minutes left, but uh, one of the aspects as I was doing research that I was not aware of was the educational component, working with high school kids. Mm -hmm. um, and that may even be a bigger facet than I was aware of. Um, could you talk about that a little bit? Because I, that was my first time learning that Aurora had that piece as well. Yeah, no, I mean, it's actually something that we've had within every one of our exhibitions is some student involvement um, and mentorship programs where we engage uh, our local students from high school down um, to, uh, we even have done something like at the Momentous Institute where we're trying to get um, today's youth involved in technology as an actual tool for the arts as a computer as a paintbrush kind of aspect to it. And so we were very fortunate and meet Neelu Genovod from Booker T. Washington. Uh, and she helped us bring, I think, four projects to life through Booker T. Washington. Um, I've also had a beautiful mentor named uh, Emily Corgan, who has helped me engage at the Winston School. And I'm now a board member on the Winston School. And so we started bringing the Winston School in here into Aurora as well and saying, hey, you've got to meet these new artists. You've got to understand what's happening today in the art, not just yesterday. Um, and then Good Shepherd Episcopal School was another school we worked with. Uh, so there's smaller programs um, and we'll normally do on-site, like learning hands-on things for kids during our exhibition. So um, I think as part of my like personal kind of like love is making sure tomorrow's arts are larger and there's more artists in their art than there is today. 
uh, you have to have educational programs. You have to work with students. Um, you have to go in there and be hit with the questions of why uh, from today's youth and really be able to answer them. I'm, one of my hardest, you know, what I'd say is like one of my hardest interviews was really done by an eighth grader out of a, a spark program at Good Shepherd. You know, I walked in for a class of eight and he just drilled me in an interview. And I was like, man, you're, you're pulling the great interview, man. You're going to be fantastic later in life. <laughs> um, final question. Uh, since the nature of technology is to change so rapidly in a way that, uh, is, is probably, oh, I hate to use the word unprecedented right now because it's being overused, but in a way that is really unprecedented, yeah. um, any, any new technology risks being obsolete uh, five years later, or at, le or at least um, kind of out of touch with, with the latest thing. How do you personally keep on top of the field? Do you have certain strategies? I, I read constantly new articles, uh, blogs, uh, lots of people, different festivals as well. There is several festivals out there uh, and, ex and exhibitions that we keep in communication with and what their focus is in the next couple years. Um, it's really the keeping your pulse on the artist and having a, a relevant conversation uh, with as many artists as possible because it does change so fast. Um, but yeah, that, that's a hard one. It's really kind of cool to see, um, you know, looking back over 10 years of how things even just change from the submissions that we would get uh, in the very beginning to how like, I remember 2011 inflatables, like well, that was a really big thing. Like everybody had these you know, um, motion-centered fans to blow up different things and different performers and play I was like, okay. And then, you know, 2013 came and it was 3D mapping and a lot of different projects um, working on architectural and projection. 2015, a lot of different, like, connection and touch points. Like, how are we connected and how are we connected to technology? Um, I think a lot of people think when you say tech that it has to have this computer moment in it or this robot doing a work of art or something like that. But then a lot of this can be the concept of what is technology doing to us as a species and a human? What is technology doing to us as a whole, as a planet? You know, and how are those affected? So not just making the work be about the latest and greatest technology, but also about continuing the dialogue of what has, you know, 20 years of an internet done to us, you know. Um, and we are already to the end of the interview. Joshua King, co-founder and executive director of Aurora. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm Betsy on staff at the Cedars Union. At, and uh, I'm throwing it back to my coworker, Adrian, to wrap up. Okay, thank you guys. That was, um, was great. I learned a lot. Uh, we have another webinar coming up in two weeks. Sorry, I'm like getting end of day tired. Um, on uh, SEO, search engine optimization. So if anybody listening is interested in learning more about how they could be better found on Google or any other search engine you might use, check that out and that's it have a great evening all right guys thank you very thank much thank you